Bonjour et bienvenue à tous et à toutes. Nous sommes heureux de vous accueillir à la sixième session d'atelier de la série Boîte et outils en sciences humaines numériques. Je suis Jada Watson, coordinatrice des sciences humaines numériques à l'Université d'Ottawa. Good morning and welcome to this new session of the DH Toolbox series. I'm Jada Watson, coordinator of digital humanities at the University of Ottawa. Before we begin today, I'd like to start our session with an Indigenous, indigenous land affirmation. Jada, sorry, before you start, I've just seen the paper in front of the camera. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to tilt up a little bit? Uh, we've got uh, you and your jawline rather than your face. Yeah, okay. perfect. perfect. Thanks, guys. Better? Yeah, if you stand right there, perfect. Okay. Nous rendons hommage au peuple agonqué, gardien traditionnel de cette terre. Nous reconnaissons le lien sacré de longue date, l'unissant à ce territoire qui demeure non cédé. Nous rendons également hommage à, à tous les peuples autochtones qui habitent Ottawa, qu'ils soient de la région ou d'ailleurs au Canada. Nous reconnaissons les gardiens des savoirs traditionnels jeunes et âgés. Nous honorons aussi le, leurs courageux dirigeants d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge the long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people from all regions across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old. And we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. Thank you for joining us in person in the creator space and online today um, from around the country. I'm absolutely honored to present this week's speaker to you, an alumni of the Minor in Digital Humanities here at the University of Ottawa and the 2020 Class Valedictorian of the Faculty of Arts. Candid Uyanze will discuss her research and creative design process behind the thesis Digitized Diasporic Memory, which she just completed at OCAD. The project is a collective conversational archive which explores the relationship, intersections, connections, and divergent experiences between Black people in the African di diaspora residing on Turtle Island. In this session, Candid will cover how she used Airtable and OcoDB, uh, I'm assuming I'm pronouncing that properly, <laughs> to create a collaborative database of crowdsourced audio memories which respond to each other. She will discuss how she used LogSec, an open source knowledge base, to convert the database into a web application that maps and visualizes the connections between submitted stories. Our guest today, Candid Uyanze, is a multimedia, multidisciplinary, and multi hyphenate doer of things. She has been described as a producer, digital, digital artist, video editor, photographer, designer, researcher, teacher, daughter, sister, and friend. Her practice explores diasporic storytelling, immersive web experiences, open source tools, accessible media production, African languages, and online networks and communities. She holds the MDES from Digital Futures at, um, from OCAD University, and the Honors BA in Communication and Digital Humanities from here at the University of Ottawa. We're so thrilled to welcome Candid back to the University of Ottawa to talk about her thesis project. Um, please do feel free to ask questions as you have them. If you're here in person, just raise your hand and I'll let Candid feel those, field those questions. And if you're joining us remotely, I will wait for an appropriate moment to pause in the presentation and ask um, the question on your behalf and you can post those questions in the Q&A. Um, please feel free to ask questions in French or in English. Uh, donc, uh, veuillez uh, demander des questions en français et en anglais. And without further ado, I introduce Candid. Thank you so much. I'm just going to um, put up my slides. I think they might have been Um. Okay, perfect. Okay. 
Perfect. Well, thank you so much, uh, Julia, for the introduction. I'm very honored. Can you just tilt your camera up again. We only have uh, your middle half there. A little bit more? Yeah, perfect. Because the camera's at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So there's only so much. Unless it's better to me to, for, for me to sit down. Yeah. yeah. We've got you in. Anyway. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, so yes, thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to start our presentation. Uh, so you know that moment when you hear a sound and that sound reminds you of a memory and that memory takes you back to your favorite place and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, imagine connecting these thoughts with the memories of others or what Anne-Laure Leconte describes as mind-to-mind -mind networks. Anne-Laure Leconte describes this as the int the internet is a giant network, uh, is a giant mental network. In theory, it would be possible to connect or to create a miniature version of the web by creating one node which connects to others, as she describes in this, um, in this quote. With this idea in mind, I present to you digitized diasporic memory, leveraging user-generated and open source tools for collective audio storytelling. So you're probably wondering, well, what is digitized diasporic memory? Well, as Jada described, this is a research creation thesis project that I completed as part of my master's in design and digital futures at OCAD University. So it's made up of four components. So there's a database, there's a network graph, thesis document, of course, and the website. So the first component is the participatory study. So for this study, I recruited black participants of African descent who resided on Turtle Island for a month long study. Together, we brainstormed prompts and entered them in a database. And those prompts um, were memories. There were things that people remember hearing from their elders, um, expressions that their parents would say, that kind of thing. So those were the kinds of prompts. And I will just play this video here, which kind of illustrates how this process happened. So after we came up with these prompts, um, each participant was invited to listen to the prompts. Um, oops, respond to the prompts of their choice by recording the response and then putting it in this database like this. So as you can see, they would give it a name, they would say what prompt or what other response they're responding to, and then selecting it from the database. And then um, you were able to like add the file in there. So it was this like cyclical iterative process where you would put in a response, listen to it, respond, record the response and put it back. We also had listening sessions where um, we listened to some of the responses and then together we had conversations about them and I, I would ask participants like what do you think of this what does this make you think about and then we had conversations there so those conversations were recorded um, split up into segments so the segments were one person every time someone spoke it was like a different segment and then those segments were put back into the database so that's the first component this video. So the next component was the um, graph, which is the most popular one. So using the study's contributions, I produced a network graph which illustrated the relationships between all the audio segments. So it was a visualization of the database as a graph, and each node was one of the audio, audio segments. So as you can see, there is around um, 137 different segments. And when you clicked on the node, it would take you to the audio segment. So this just kind of shows how the, the network graph works. And just skip over. So yeah, you can click on it, you can play the audio, and then it kind of shows the connections between all the audio. So it shows what the person was responding to and the responses to that audio. And then this kind of shows you how you can navigate it using kind of hyperlinks. So um, this network graph was presented on touch screens for the um, OCAD University GradX, which is the graduate exhibition, um, as well as the graduate ex exhibition for our program specifically. So these are just some images showing you how people interacted with them by touching on the screen. So the touch screen was like on a table um, and people could interact with it and listen using speakers. So of course, the third component is a thesis document, which goes into more de detail on the theories, the concepts, research methods and the design process. 
And then there's, of course, the website. So the website, I'm just going to play video. So the website kind of links back to the other components. Um, and in the future, we'll include tutorials to kind of show people how to recreate this project. Um, so now that you know a little bit of what this project is, I'll talk about the why I created this project and how the project was made. So, Digitized Diasporic Memory was born from a previous project called In My Tongue, which was a project on the politics of language. So, it's a project I did with my friend Trish Kananamwenda um, as part of our interactive documentary class at OCAD. So, each of us interviewed our friends and family, and we asked them about the relationships they had with the languages they speak and other memories of that sort. So, we would ask a question, um, our interviewee would reply, and then we'd ask a question, etc. And then we would remove our questions in the final database. So that's kind of like shows the website. So every segment was just a response of what we asked. Um, so that was the starting point. Um, yeah, so all students were able to kind of create whatever interactive project they wanted to create. And then we decided to make ours on language. Yeah. Um, however, as I started listening to the interviews that Trish, so my collaborator, um, conducted, I found a lot of similarities and parallels between what her participants were saying and some of my experiences. So I'm Congolese, Trish is Kenyan, um, I grew up in Canada, she grew up in Kenya, but we, there, there was still a lot of similarities between um, the different things, and I found myself wanting to respond to her participants, and then I wondered what if our participants could talk to each other and how that would look. Um, so that's when I realized kind of the limitations of this, like, typical question and answer format, um, where there's not really any space for tangents or kind of drifting off and going off script. Um, so then I started asking myself questions like, what if participants could interact with each other? Um, what if we broke away from this Q&A script, which is something I learned um, when I was doing communication studies here at U Ottawa? Um, and how could the tangents be part of the design? And I was interested in this idea of redistributing the power amongst participants to create a counter archive or rogue archive um, as Abigail the Kosnik calls it. So how could this many-to-many -many conversations be um, documented and also visualized? So I started to think about the idea of archives as conversations and archives of conversation and uh, connecting the past, the present, and the future, ideas, memories, sounds, emotions, that kind of thing, um, collectively, but in like a non-linear, scattered way. So in a way that would defy Western concepts of time and space. One of the major influences of this project is the film The Last Angel of History by John Acumfra and the Black Audio Film Collective. So in this film, um, there is one of the um, people who were interviewed, his name is uh, Greg Tate, and he details how sam the sampling era in music collapsed all eras of Black music onto a computer chip. Um, and it did this to form a digitized race memory. So the project Digitized Iceberg Memory was inspired by a lot of the keywords in this film. And he said that the digitized race memory allowed um, Black creatives to freely reference and cross-reference previous generations of sounds, but simultaneously. In a similar vein, um, Tabitha Rezard's video artwork, Premium Connect, explores the function of ancestral and traditional memory and how it relates to technology, computer memory, quantum physics, IFA divination, and the underground network of plants. So as one of the protagonists explains, we only live for one lifetime and can only remember so much as one person. That is why we communicate with our ancestors as a divine consciousness or a divine internet, as the, the person described it. So this allows us to, do, to draw on the collective minds or the collective computers um, and lifetimes of the ones who came before us. So this is another work that was a huge inspiration to digitize, digitize diasporic memory. So when thinking about this idea of sampling and knowledge sharing from the past, especially in the context of the African diaspora, um, I considered the importance of oral histories in a lot of our cultures. Um, for example, the idea of the griot that we see in um, West African cultures, whose role it is to carry on collective memory. I also think about Sherry Ann Smark's uh, writing on the Library of Crisis, 
um, which talks about how um, this library of crisis is embodied within enslaved African people and how they were a repository of skills and knowledge that were orally, orally transmitted to the next um, generations, even till this day. Um, this is why the primary focus of my project was on the overlapping traditions and collective ancestral memory um, of people of African descent, and it uses audio stories, um, which is a question I get a lot, like, why is it only audio? Why is there no, like, visuals? It's because of I don't, the importance of oral um, tradition. Um, so leveraging collective intelligence is important, not just for generational knowledge sharing, um, but also for open source software. So if you might have noticed in the I guess, tagline of my thesis project, it mentions open, using open tools. Um, so I'm a big fan of open source communities and how people come together to collaborate on code openly. And I like this idea of subverting the idea of authorship, ownership, intellectual property and control um, to create open collaboration. And I felt like this made a lot of sense with the kind of project that I was doing. Um, as I was um, researching more on open source software and open source communities, I did encounter some critiques of the movement. So um, detractors such as the Peer to Peer Foundation noted the corporatization of open source software projects, um, how the, there's inequitable profits shared with big corporations essentially using open source software, which for a lot of projects is made using the free labor of um, volunteer developers. So that was one of the, um, the things that I, I noted. Um, the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation also gives the example of traditional open licenses, which allow many indigenous communities to retain the knowledge of medicinal herbs that were created by their comments, but they're still at risk of corporate bodies who don't practice um, profit sharing. Dylan Robinson um, also describes uh, the Western imperative for all knowledge to be accessible at all times which is in contrast to um, situated and context specific practices of indigenous knowledge sharing guided by protocol. So indeed, this notion of knowledge as being freely accessible and open um, having historically been used to exploit countries of the global south, as well as on Turtle Island. So that's something that I wanted to, to keep in mind. Um, even though I am a big fan of open source software, I did have to kind of think about um, the software that I was using, how I was giving back to the people who were um, creating these projects and supporting them if, if monetarily or by helping contributing code or by reporting bugs and that kind of thing. Um, so Wendy Liu says that in order to reconnect free and open source software to the radical corporate unfriendly beginnings of the movement, it's just tapping into open source communities as gateways to bolder and more radical politics of decommodification for both information and material knowledge. Um, and I just wanted to note that if you are interested in knowing a bit more about the relationship of intellectual property um, to innovation, traditional knowledge, legal frameworks, open collaboration, especially in the African context, there is a research network called the Open African Innovation Research Network or Open Air, and they actually have a hub here at U Ottawa. So, that's pretty cool. I've worked with them before and um, yeah, I definitely recommend looking into their, their white papers and books to learn more. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit more about the technologies that I use to create the project. Um, my initial hope when I was working on this project was to um, create some kind of software where um, someone would see the, note, the network graph, they'd be able to listen to it and then respond immediately. And then when they would respond, it would create another node. So I was hoping it would create that streamlined process, um, but that didn't happen because that kind of thing didn't exist. So I actually had to build the project off of another project and also separate the database from the network graph, which I'll explain later, um, which was a pretty complicated process, but yeah. So uh, the initial study was facilitated using Airtable. Um, so Airtable is a low code collaborative spreadsheet database hybrid. Um, I'll, I'll show you an example, actually. So I'll just switch over to duplicating the displays. Okay, so you should be able now to see my screen. Um, I'll share my screen again for Zoom. And I will exit out of here. Okay. 
Oops. Sorry about it. I'll just stop sharing my screen because it seems like ah, there it is. It's hidden. Okay, so my <laughs> it's on the edge of the um, the edge of the screen and. Okay, there we go. Okay. Okay, there we go. So yeah, so I was talking about Airtable. So the nice thing about Airtable, um, and the reason why I picked it, you'll see my notes now, um, is because it's collaborative, you can preview audio. Um, so if I go on to I will, if I go into Airtable, so this is the, the database that we actually use during the study. And the nice thing about it is that um, when we would upload our audio responses, you could actually listen to the audio. Recreate. This is one of the prompts, but you could actually listen to the prompts and the contributions inside of the application, which was a nice thing. Um, it was collaborative, so multiple people could be in there at the same time, and there was no like um, conflicts because it's cloud-based. And what I really like about Airtable is that you can make connections with other entries. So for example, in here, I have this, this entry is a response to another entry within the same table. So you can create those connections that way, which was useful for the purpose of the project. So that was the nice thing um, about Airtable. Um, the downsides with using it as the database is that the storage was coupled with the application. And what that means is that when you would upload a file, it would be stored in their storage, but me as an end user, I don't have access to that storage. So um, part of the study and part of like the ethics clearance was that people would be allowed to delete um, their audio if they wanted to, or even in the future. But there was no guarantee that if you deleted it from this um, front end application, that it was deleted in their actual database or in their actual <laughs> storage, sorry. Um, so even if, let's say, you had access to that URL, you could still access that audio, even though it was removed from here. So that was one of the issues with their storage. Um, the other issue is that you can't use it for hot linking. So I'll explain that um, for hot linking. So hot linking is when you use, when you store something on another server, and then you refer to it. So you use that URL to that exact file on their storage, and then you embed it on like something else. So in order to use the audio that was uploaded here on like the other network graph, I had to use hot linking. Um, but there, I researched this and one of the developers on their forums were like, you can't use it for that purpose uh, because the URL that refers to our storage, we might change the way that that URL is generated. So then that would just break the application. So it, like long term, it wasn't a good idea to, to just rely on this. Um, so yeah, so those were the main issues that I had. And also the free plan. So at the time of me using it, I was fine. But as you see now, it's like over limits because they've changed their free plan. They've restricted it a lot more. Um, so yeah, as a long-term strategy, using this wasn't a, a great idea. So the alternative um, that I found that was open source was called NoCodeDB. So the nice thing about that is that you could separate the storage from the application. And I'll show you what I mean. So this is uh, NoCodeDB. This is like the... This is where I transferred everything once the study was done. Um, and the nice thing about this is that you can choose your own storage. So you set up your storage with another service and then you make a link using like APIs and all kinds of things. Um, and then once when you upload a file on here, it also uploads it on your own storage that you choose. So then you have access to both. And if you delete it, if you decide to delete it here and you decide to delete it on your own storage, then it's gone. Um, which was for me was important in terms of like ethics clearance and data management and that kind of thing. Um, 
what wasn't ideal about it, so why I didn't choose NoCoDB for my actual study is that you can't undo, you can see the history of every, um, of every entry and what was changed, but while you're working on it, you can't undo. So my fear was that if someone accidentally deleted something, um, they wouldn't be able to restore it or they, it would just be a bit of a mess. So that was one of the reasons. Um, and the other reason was you couldn't, you can't um, preview audio within this application the same way that you can on Airtable. So if I go here, for example, and I click on one of the audio files, it just, it either prompts me Recreate to- Recreate the sound of something. Or it opens it separately like this. So you can't listen to it in the application. Um, and that's a problem, obviously, if you're listening to a lot of them and you want to respond. So it wasn't as um, smooth. So then the solution was to have Airtable for the study and then using this for the like public facing database. So if you go on the, the project's website and then you look at the database, you're looking at the NoCoDB, like an embed of that NoCoDB database. So you can go in, you can download the files, listen to them, remix them and whatnot. So yeah, so that's what I used for the database. Um, and then LogSeq. So um, LogSeq is what I used for the network graph. So I have it in here. Um, and LogSeq essentially when you download it kind of, okay, there we go. So when you download it, it kind of looks like this. It doesn't really look as colorful as you see it now. And that's because, because it is open source, you can update the um, CSS, you can give it all kinds of, um, you can change the aesthetic basically. So LogSeq is a note-taking application. Um, the way that it works is that when you create a project, it creates folders, and then all the pages that you create um, are stored in Markdown. So Markdown is an open file format. You can edit it outside of it. So you don't need this application to edit those files, but it is handy. And the way that it works, so I created a demo page here, is that um, you can make links to other pages. So I'm gonna create a new page using double brackets. And then now when I click away and I click here, I created a new page and it says that, hey, this page references you. So it creates that like, that bi-directional um, connection. And the nice thing about that is when you create connections between um, between pages, it shows it on here. So I have, this is my like personal um, notebook. So you'll see other pages, but you see here the new page and the demo page, it shows that like, hey, these two pages are connected and are talking to each other. So that's the nice thing about LockSeq. I'm just gonna go back to my notes. Okay, so yeah, so um, the good thing about LockSeq is that the community is, it's an open source software, so the community is very active. They're always creating plugins, themes, and that kind of thing. Um, like I mentioned, you can edit the look and feel. So I actually have the, um, this is the, the customizations I've made to, to make this application here look like the orange, yellow thing that you see over here. Um, and you can embed media. So I'm actually going to open the project that I used for my own project the LogSeq graph that I use for my own project. Um, so this is what it looks like on the back end. And if I go to one, yes. Oh, is it? Oh, hmm. sorry. Okay. Can you, are you able to see it now? Presentation. Oh, I think we're going to get this. If you stop sharing and share the whole screen. Yeah, that would be better than sharing the application. Okay. Yeah, screen. I think and this will work. It works? Yes, that works. Okay. So sorry to anyone joining us online who might have missed it. Um, but I, yeah, I was essentially talking about this application here called LogSeq. So when you open it, um, I'm just going to go back to my notes. So when you first create it, it kind of looks like this. It's pretty plain. Um, but because it's open source, you can add some custom code to make it look however you want to look. Um, when you create a page, 
when you have a page, you can create a new page and call this other page. And then when you have this other page and you click on it, it shows that, hey, this page is mentioning the other page. So then when you go into the graph view, it shows the connection between those pages. So I have my demo page here, the other page. So it's a nice way of visualizing those bi-directional connections. So as I was mentioning, the nice thing about Luxseek is that you can also embed Medium. So if I go in here, this is the actual um, graph that I use for the, the network graph that you see online. Um, but this is just kind of like how it looks like on the application. And if you go in here, you'll see that there is this little, there's like some HTML that I've embedded. And then you see here a link to the audio on my storage. So then when I click away, it previews the audio, you can listen to it. And then that's how it works. Um, yeah, so the downsides of using LockSeq was that it wasn't multi-user or cloud-based. So it's not like Airtable where multiple people can be in there and adding things. Um, I, I can only use it locally for now. I think they're making changes, but at the time of, of working on this project, it wasn't possible, which is why I had to make like a separate database and then bring it into, into LockSeq. Um, and like I said, there was 137 audio segments. And by the time the study finished, I only had like a few weeks before the thesis defense and the graduate exhibition and all those things. Um, so I was looking for a way to kind of generate all the pages that I needed quickly, because like I mentioned, um, this is this is the folders that you get when you create a new Luxie project. Um, there it is. OK, so all the pages are in markdown here. So they're just kind of like these text notes. Um, and I was looking for ways to quickly generate them using, I, I was aware of like mail merge or like merge tags or those kinds of things where you have a template and then you have um, a database or a spreadsheet of some kind and then you quickly generate all the pages. So I was like, is there a way of, of doing that with LockSeq? Um, there wasn't, but I was actually, I found a project that was similar and I talked to, I had a conversation with the developer and he's like, yeah, I could like make this using Python. So luckily someone, some nice kind soul um, part of the community created an application where I was able to have the, the template and connect it to the, um, the database. So I had to download it as a CSV and then I, could, I was able to quickly generate um, all the pages, which took some, some time because the names of the files created issues and all that kind of thing. But yeah, that's how I was able to quickly create that using, it was like a Python script. Um, and then once I was done, so as you can see, the, the graph is on the internet. Um, the nice thing about LockSeq is that you can export your project, your export your graph as public pages. And then what that does is that it creates like a static website, so like an HTML website, and then you can host it on like GitHub pages or Netlify drop or that kind of thing. Um, I use GitHub desktop and GitHub pages because it's just, just easier for me, but anywhere where you can host those kinds of files. So I think that's it. Yeah, that's it for my presentation. Um, any questions? I know some things were missed, but I'm happy to go back and redemonstrate things. And I guess I'd reiterate for anyone online, um, if you want that demo again, let us know in yeah. the Q&A because we can make sure that that um, happens so you can see it. Um, but yeah, if anyone has questions, Dive in, Rene. It's, it's almost more of a request. Would, could we hear like a sample of the oh. audio? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I wasn't sure if I had time. Response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tons of time. For sure. So I'm just going to um, hide this and go in here. So there was a particular one that I was thinking like, oh, I could probably play this. Um, I think this is the beginning of it. No, it's not. Okay, so the prompt was like recreate the sound right now I think there's a bug here, but it says like recreate the sound of something you constantly heard growing up. And then one of the participants, her name is Kamaria, this is what she re responded. <laughs> um, so then these were some of the responses. Um, this here is so much so that's my mother. Um, her 
what she says is in French, so yeah, for those who can understand. Le fameux chip. Oh mon Dieu. Ben, c'est la chose qui revient, la chose qui revient du coup, là, quand on est fâché, la, la chose la, la plus facile ou la, la façon la plus facile de s'exprimer ou de manifester son mécontentement quand on est fâché ou quand on est frustré. Euh, mais c'est aussi la chose à faire ou à... à comment, il, faut, il, faudrait avoir, il, faut, il faudrait savoir se contenir avant de, de, de sortir ces, ces chips-là. Surtout euh, à l'endroit de certaines personnes donc, au Congo. Mm. C'est quelque chose à ne jamais, jamais faire euh, aux, enfin, aux personnes qui sont plus âgées ou aux personnes qui ont un peu plus d'autorité que soi, comme, comme nos parents ou euh, euh, oncles, tantes, les, les gens de la famille qui sont plus âgés, peut-être grands frères ou grandes sœurs, cousins, cousines, comme plus âgés bien sûr. On peut, on peut bien le faire entre, entre, entre enfants, comme des gens de, de même âge ou peut-être... Euh, moins âgés, entre amis, ça passe. Ben, c'est vrai que ce n'est pas quelque chose qu'on qu qu prononce quand on est content. Hein. On, le prononce, on le dit quand on est, on est fâché, c'est sûr et certain. Mais entre amis, ça passe. On sait au moins que non, non elle est fâchée, c'est pourquoi elle a dit ça ou elle a fait ça. Mais comme je disais, pour, pour, envers les adultes, non, c'est vraiment à bannir, à ne même pas essayer. Donc, ça, c'est au niveau du Congo. Je ne sais pas ailleurs comment, comment c'est perçu, mais au Congo, c'est ça. Donc, euh, la signification du chip. Yeah, so the, um, sorry, I'm just going to get some water. Um, I was going to say the interesting thing about this sound is that Kamaria is Jamaican. Um, I'm Congolese, my mom's Congolese. We had um, another participant who was Burundian. The interesting thing was that was like the sound that we all, we all knew despite, you know, being from different um, ethnicities. And that's why it generated so much conversation, like different people either recreating it or talking about the significance of them or how they found it funny. Or since my mom's older, it's like, oh, that's not something that you do to adults because it's like a sign of disrespect. Um, so yeah, so that's that's an example. Um, see if there's, you can also browse through the, um, the segments just by looking at all the, all the pages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, this quick, like, follow up yeah. on that because it's really fascinating you know, like to try to think of how else you could have captured that information is like I, it's really hard to imagine mm -hmm. and so it's, it's really interesting because it's like you've managed to capture something that's you know it's probably part of your lived in experience growing up and like but other people might not know about and now it's like you, you have that question. i'm just curious like I'm always so being the GIS person. I'm always thinking of like, oh, how can we add like a GIS component? And not all projects require that, but mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious. Like, one way could be like tracing the origin of where a certain, you know, practice or sound or whatever saying came from, and mm -hmm. connecting it to that way. I mentioned like that's common in like in, in Congo or Jamaica or whatever. So it'd be interesting to see like this. Could also have come from these places. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is this is like kind of unrelated to my specific project, but related to what you said and related to memories and site specificity. Um, one of my favorite projects. I think I have it in here. If not, I'll just Google it. Um, yeah, which is also like I guess you could say a digital humanities project um, where memories. Um, are tied to place, which is really nice. I don't know if you've, you've heard about this one. Um, I think it's loading. But yeah, so it's like a map um, where people of the LGBTQ plus community kind of share memories of like, oh, at this place, you know, I had my first kiss or this, this happened and that happened. So yeah, it's, I think it's taking a while to load, but this is, this is a really nice example of what you described but for within another community. So yeah, so there's like this, and it's worldwide too. There's little markers everywhere in the world. <laughs> yeah, I think it started in Montreal. Then they're like, let's let's go around the world. So yeah, it's it's anyways. It's taking a while to load. I encourage everyone to, to kind of look at it um, on their own their own devices. <laughs> but um yeah, you see there there's there's memories really everywhere in the world, and um, 
yeah, I guess it, it would it would be interesting to also look at at that from my perspective. But yeah, I just wanted to show this because you mentioned JS. Yeah, like no, this is this cool. is such a great example of that. Um, we yeah. have a couple of online questions, and I'll just stand close so sure. you can hear them in the audience here, but also everyone online can hear them as well. Mm -hmm. So first, um, a note of congratulations from uh, Professor Bulubanda de Berberi. Uh, bravo, very impressed to me, felicitations. Um, from our colleague in Montreal, great presentation. How many hours were logged at your end to do the technical side of the site, not the interviews? <laughs> it was a lot. Um, and the, I guess, interesting thing about this project is that LogSeq was something that I was using just for my own thesis, just to, because it was getting to a point where I was getting all kinds of feedback and notes and things, and it was getting hard to, to keep track of things. And um, you would think to just put things in folders and have them live separately, like, oh, this note from this class and this feedback from this meeting I had with my advisor. But I was like, how can I link them? Because it doesn't make sense to kind of compartmentalize everything. Um, so I was using LuxSeq separately. So I was learning how to use it in a different context. And then I was like, wait, there's like this cool network graph option. What if I could use it in my own thesis? So there's, it's hard to say how many hours were logged because a lot of it was just for, diff for other things, like even learning CSS, which I, I showed here to customize the look and feel of it, was something that I learned for another, I was learning for another project for separately, and then I was like, oh, it actually makes sense here, because now I can, I can make this look, um, exactly, <laughs> exactly, so yeah, it's tough to say, but a lot of it, like near the end, I really had to, to rush to do a lot of things, um, and like I said, I'm really thankful for that developer, so the project was called I think CSV to MV, yes. I don't know what the person's name is. It's just Aero, AeroViz01 on GitHub. Um, but yeah, this was a project that was created. And it even says this idea came from a discussion with, with Candid, mm -hmm. which is me. So yeah, I'm really thankful for this person because they, they saved me so much time. Because otherwise, I would have had to add them manually into Blockseek. But then I was just able to generate it. So yeah, sorry, I don't have a response. I don't have. Set amount many. of hours, but we many, 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> many. More time on technical side than on interviews. Yes, especially <laughs> since the interviews weren't edited. Like in the in my tongue, the previous project, um, we had to like remove the silences and the ums and that kind of thing. And for this one, I wanted to keep them. Um, so the yeah, the project itself, like in terms of interviews and that kind of thing, didn't take as much time as figuring out the tech throughout the course of a year. Yeah. All right. So. From Professor Crompton, this was cool. Thank you for showing us LockSeq under the hood. The HTML export seems like such a good way to ensure longevity. Um, I should stop gushing, she says, and ask a question. <laughs> I'm very impressed by the multiple ways to browse through the LockSeq markdown. Have you or do you plan to do UI testing to see how users navigate through the graph text and audio? That's a good question. Um... I definitely, I didn't think of UI testing for the graph. I think I thought it more for the website because I was like, I feel like, I, I showed it to my little sister who's 15 and she's like, what does this word mean? Like, I don't understand what this project is about um, on the homepage, but I, I, you're right that it would be a good idea to do some UI testing. Um, so right now I'm kind of like in the maintenance mode of the project. A lot of people are like, oh, are you adding more snippets and expanding it? Um, but for now it's more just maintenance and teaching people how it, it works under the hood. Um, the big thing was the transcriptions, like working on adding transcriptions. That's what I've been working on the past few weeks. Um, but UI testing is also another good good idea. So this is fascinating to me, Candid. You have graduated. You've defended. You've graduated. You're done. Yeah. And and you're still going to be working on this. So you're committed to maintaining it for a long time. Yeah, or just making it look good. As you said, better, more accessible, and yeah. testing is, is definitely a good one. And also teaching. I think the big thing that I'm at now is just being like, hey, this is how it works. This is how you can make it. Um, and since the software also is, they're constantly improving and constantly changing. I also have to like update the the software that's used for the database. I have to update the the graph. Um, and also, hopefully, someday I, you should be able to collaborate on LockSeq without having to have that having to transfer it from one place to another. Right. So that's the hope. As a follow up, um, Professor Crompton says maintenance is half the work of DH projects and we should support and celebrate it more. I agree. <laughs> um, we've had a request for another demo of, um, I think it's the LockSeq portion mm -hmm. that 
uh, wasn't displayed the first time. So could we have another demo of that? For sure. Okay, I'm trying to think. I'll go in like my the plain notes one. So essentially how Loxseq works is that it's a note taking application. It's like a knowledge graph. I think that's what they the way that they describe it. And if you do if you have double brackets, you can create a new page. So I'll think of another name. Um, call it third page. And then if you click away, and then you click yeah, sometimes it's a bit tricky. You click away, you click on it, it brings you to this new page you created. And it mentions where this page is mentioned. So now it says, oh, this is a linked reference. And there's also something interesting that I haven't used for my own project. It's called unlinked references. So if you have another page where the the word third or the phrase third page is mentioned, it'll put it in unlinked references and say, hey, there, there wasn't a direct connection created, but this word was mentioned. The, the name of this page was mentioned in another page. So that's the interesting part. And then when you go in the graph view, you can see the connections between the pages. So I'm just gonna put on journals. Um, I don't know where third page went. Mm. Ah, there it is. So third page is here. If I click on it, it brings me to that page. And then there's also something called a page graph, which just shows whatever connections um, this page has to the other pages. So it's like its own graph. I think that covers it. Yeah. Um, it's very, this is a very like rough demo of, of um, Loxseq. And I can also show on my, on the actual project that I use on the back end. Um, what I did for my own project is that I added this. Um, so Loxseq uses Clojure, I think that's how it's pronounced. It's like some kind of um, programming language. And in order to embed HTML snippets, this is what you do is you put like the two arobas and then HTML. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I think there's a simpler way of adding audio, but that's what I use because I'm familiar with HTML. And then I have the source here of the audio stored on my on the storage that I had. So then when you click away, it embeds the audio. Um, I also have the transcripts, like I said, that I'm working on. And then it shows the connection. So it shows like, oh, this page here was mentioned in this page. And then, etc. So obviously, when I export it as a as a public page, a lot of that is hidden away. So if I go in here, they recently introduced this, like the export CSS. So that's these are things that are hidden when you export it as a public page. Um, so as you can see, a lot of things are hidden, um, just to make it look a little nicer. Right. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. I'm going to monopolize this for a moment. Um, what has been the response? to the individuals who participated in this, your family, your friends, people who might have contributed who were not part of your close circle. Mm -hmm. um, how, how has the response, like, how has this sort of been an important, um, not just resource, but like community building mm -hmm. um, opportunity for individuals? Yeah, so um, when I was recruiting people, I like I asked all of them, like, what were you, what was your hope? And a lot of people just wanted to share parts of their own culture with other people. And I think what I found nice, because I, I also participated, as you can see here, <laughs> um, is that it's just like that, that like sense making and then just just, you know, someone who's from a different ethnicity being like, oh, we do this. And it's like, oh, what does that mean? Tell us more about that. I know it's kind of similar to what we do, but kind of different and just like learning from each other, I think was a big part of that. Um, and I'm trying to remember what else we discussed in like the, cause we had a session where we kind of reflected on the experience. Uh, oh yeah, so it was, I, I made like social media posts on my own social media. Um, I asked other organizations to share them. Um, I didn't have a lot of time to recruit, which is why, like I said, a lot of it was like people I knew. There was only, I think, one participant out of the seven that I didn't know personally. I mean, a lot of people also dropped off. It was just like a weird time. And I think if I were to do this again, I would just spend more time for recruitment. Um, but yeah, I think just that like sharing and even even if a lot of them were people that I knew, it was still nice to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. um, there's even a segment where I recall something that my mom said and then my mom joined in later on the study and was like, actually, this that's not what I meant. This is what I meant. 
Um, so that was like an interesting, I think that just the, the sense making and, and sharing of cultures was interesting. And so to follow up on that, mm -hmm. doing this all during a global pandemic, did that sort of add a dimension that you were not expecting? Yeah, so when I started my master's, this was in 2020, so I had graduated and then everything was closed. I started in the pandemic, so we were online. I was still in Ottawa, actually, for that first year. Um, so then we thought that, oh, we would have to think about doing it online, like our actual thesis projects. So I didn't consider doing something in person. And then once we were in that weird period in 2021, where it was like, oh, we're like going back and forth. I was like, OK, maybe, you know, I could do something. I could have like an in-person component. And then our, our professors were really stressing that, like, you shouldn't think of it like as online. You should think of doing something in person and physical, because a lot of people did wearables in my program. Um, so then it, it shifted to that. And then I was like, OK, maybe I can have like a recording session in person. So we come up with the prompts virtually, and then we come together and record and have conversations that way. Um, and then I was like, OK, no, that's not going to work. So it's back online, um, which is why some of the um, segments are kind of the quality is not great because there was like a recording of a of a video conference, kind of like on Zoom. Um, so, yeah, I think that affected it. But at the same time, since it was all it was always going to be a web application, it were it worked for me in that right. sense. Yeah. But then also I'm even thinking sort of of the emotional side of it mm -hmm. that I can imagine that there was also in a moment when we were all feeling like very fragmented and disconnected um, and being able to communicate virtually that this could have had the opportunity for some to be like also a very healing and community building mm -hmm. um, moment during pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely agree on that on that point. Um, I can't. I guess I can't speak for for other people right. in terms of like for the you. pandemic, but for me, like it was it was tough. <laughs> like even just outside of this project, just doing grad school, doing grad school in general is is tough, and then doing it during a pandemic is really really tough. So um, it was. I think working on this is what kept me going, and also my my own community, like my classmates, um, one of whom actually participated in the project. Um, it was something nice to look forward to because, yeah, it was there was a lot of times even in that last semester, it was like, oh, maybe I can just drop out, you know, um, this is getting to be a bit too much. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So I did. I did give um, gift cards, like Visa gift cards, to all the participants. Um, it wasn't. It. It's interesting. The professors didn't really stress it or mention it when for those of us who were doing um, participant studies. But for me, it was important because they were taking the time to participate in this. So there was, I guess, monetary <laughs> um, uh, rewards and. I think just the idea of exchanging. I don't. I don't know what the the hook was. That's a the good question. I think just the idea of of talking about sounds. I think a lot of them were drawn to that. Like, oh, this is an interesting project. This is unique. I want to you know share and keep. I guess um, the participant Kamaria, who, who I mentioned earlier, she had a lot of songs and little jingles and that kind of thing that she wanted not preserved but just like archived in some way. So I think for her that was the draw. Yeah, yeah, that it did help. And it was also something to be mindful of, because it is easy for someone to be like, oh, this is my friend, like I'll share and, and share um, and not realize that, oh, this is going on the internet. So just really stressing that this is going online. And even now, participants can delete things. They all have access to the database. So if they were like, ah, you know what, actually, I don't want this on, like they can always remove it even even now, like months after the, the project. Um, so yeah, so stressing that it's um, online. And we also discussed like which Creative Commons uh, license to give the audio snippets. Um, so we discussed like what Creative Commons was and do you want people to be able to use it commercially? That was, most of, most of us were like, no, we don't want that, but sure they can download it, they can reuse it, but they have to credit it and that kind of thing. So just having those conversations was important, even if it is people that I know and trust. 
Any other questions online or in person? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Candid. Uh, make sure that you're not getting just my chin. Um, this was such a great presentation. It was so nice to learn more about your work and I've shared the link to the project and the actual thesis um, in the chat, but I'll also put it on the website for those who are in the audience who maybe wanna play around with it and, and read the project. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming in today, for sharing this with us. We will um, probably clean up the video a little bit because there are moments where you're only seeing our chin. <laughs> And then we'll put it up on YouTube so that um, folks can look back at it. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us in person and online. And join us again in two weeks. Uh, Professor Susie Ahn from the Faculty of Department of Linguistics is going to come and talk about um, ultrasound techniques um, for capturing voice. So we'll see you all again in two weeks online and in person. And have a great weekend. Or week, I should say. Have a great week. <laughs>